But it, this came about because there's a, a kid working on uh, a man named um, by George Sackheim. It was and riveting. I mean, my he, God, it was at the age of eight, everybody we were uh, speechless in the class. But your problem is that you feel now, if I remember, that he's really just using too much personal. Exactly. Um, yeah. He really kind of started to lose it when he was talking about, um, you know, but he started to lose it when he was talking about how could Rudolf Hess do this? How could these people do this? Because he's now a translator. And so, and I said, you know, you, you've got to build your attitude towards these people. And, and so what I realized was he was building his attitude towards these people. And not the characters. And not the characters. And it was, and I love, you know, the whole idea of that line that it begins to be a race that we're not sure where, where the actor ends and the character begins. But what was happening with this was, was that he was losing control, which of course is also always been a problem when people go to their own lives. It's, yes that's part of the problem with Strasbourg. Yeah, it's like you lose... No, so it is the problem with Strasbourg. Yes, and and, and that's it, and we know that it, it's... You, you and know. in film, you can comp... You know, an that's editor true. can compensate for that, but in, you know, it's still not healthy. It's not healthy. As Stella once said to someone, she said, you know, you go to therapy to solve those problems and get rid of them, not to use them. And... So, um, but that's what I suddenly realized was happening with him, is that he was... Does he have um, past or prior training that would tend to um, kick in um, I, on this, do you think? I don't think so, because... Because I, well, I ask only because I've had a couple of students in my studio who came from a Strasbourg training and they never really lent themselves to what I was doing because they were too, still too convinced that this was the right way in on some very deep level, you know? No, they... You know what? I would, um, first, I have a couple of thoughts, but they're not necessarily the best thoughts, okay? Because I, I don't have a good answer, but I have a couple of thoughts. I think it's really important to remind him that the reason Stanislavski did not want us to go to our personal, um, especially our personal pains or anything that could set us off in, in ways that would need therapy is because he was scared he was scared out of his wits when a Michael Chekhov, who was his student in the first studio, had this nervous breakdown um, because he, and he felt so guilty about um, somehow creating uh, the use of personal emotion. This is when he was using it in the first studio. He felt so guilty that he actually paid for Michael Chekhov's psychiatrist um, because Michael, uh, Michael Chekhov had such a nervous breakdown that he had st he wasn't he would do things like walk right off the stage in the middle of the performance when he was too traumatized by the role, and um, mm. that's when Stanislavski. Um, said that imagination is stronger and, and, and started worrying about the mental hygiene of his patients, I mean, his, his students who used um, their personal backgrounds too much. So it's, it, he, he got off it because he had really lost control of one of his, of his most promising students, who was a fine actor, but who had such a bad nervous breakdown in as a consequence of the work that um, he 
really didn't go out of his house for like as long as we've been in our houses. <laughs> you know, oh dear. Uh, yeah, I mean, he started coming out and getting back to normal in 1918 when he started bringing students into Chekhov, bringing students into his own house. I have another connection with Chekhov here um, because um, Chekhov has this, you know, he has this very interesting um, approach to imaginary body. And I do use this sometimes in my classes. It's not technically Stanislavski, but what it does at a certain point when you're um, able to, to, when you're getting close, especially when you're getting too close to a character, is remind you of how the character is different from you. So you can track, I mean, uh, what I do when I use it is I ask my students a series of questions that um, are how the character is different from them. It's three categories, right? How is the character physically different than you? Are they taller than you, shorter than you, fatter than Good. you? You know, That's great. Um, you know um, physically different could even be that they speak a different language than you and that means that something in your mouth is different, which might be really interesting for, say, this character. So it starts with, you know, an, a kind of a visualization of how this character looks different than you and, and, and speaks different than you and wears different clothes than you, all the physicality of the character. Then it goes from that into the sort of emotional ten tenor of the character. Like, okay, how does this per how is this person's, you know, emotional way of being in the world different than yours? I'm talking about things like, is the character more impatient or less impatient than you? Mm -hmm. Do they fly off the handle and not bear a grudge? And you do bear a grudge when you you may are you slow to anger and they're quick to anger? Are you, you know, easy to forgive and they're not easy to forgive? Thinking about all the ways in which people differ emotionally, how does this character differ from emotionally from you? I mean, I can imagine with the character you're talking about that um in order to overcome his past and become a translator at Nuremberg, this person has to have an amazing amount of uh, sort of emotional self-control mm -hmm. to be able to sit in that in those trials and listen, you know, to these horrors. And if your actor doesn't have that same kind of self-control, if that person, if your actor were sitting analogously in a courtroom in which he had been a participant in something terrible that had happened to him, would he have the same self-control as the character? You know, I mean, maybe not. So the second category is this emotional way of being in the world. And then the third category is, um, asking about their sort of will, their, their willfulness. So what I mean by that is, um, are you somebody who goes, who, who sets your sights on things and goes after it with determination? Are you willful in that particular way? Or are you the kind of person who drifts and takes opportunities or are you the kind of person who starts a project and doesn't stop a project? All of these things, okay, how is your character different from you in these ways? Is your character more determined than you or less determined than you? Is your care, are you more, um, you know, less a fair um, about going after what you want? Are you more frightened to go after what you want? Or are you the kind of person that is like a bulldog and will not let it go? So I sometimes use this. I think um, that's great. With my actors, it's coming from Michael Chekhov who had the breakdown. 
No, okay. but it's good. And also, it's interesting. I still haven't been able to get to uh, Maria Schwetzfeld's book. It's, I, I haven't either. I haven't either. It's a very difficult read. However, she does mention the word will as... Well, Stanislavski has those three main drivers. I mentioned it in focus, and I do think it... But it's like feelings, mind, and will. You know, I think it's those three. Yes. Um, and so this goes along with it. But notice how it's a little, you know, like what Chekhov is doing based on his experience is he's making that distinction um, through imaginary body from how is my character that I'm going to step into different than me. And then what he does, and he uses visualization to do it, he trains you to visualize this person standing in front of you like the other it's not you it's the other and then you physically imaginatively literally step into that body yes i'd love that i'd love yeah yeah and 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 what's cool about God, that that's is great. I mean, for check off you know he was known as somebody who you know was so uh transformative that people you know he would look taller than he is is was on stage or shorter you know simply because his imagination was so full of the difference between the character and i think with this guy it it might be something that i might try because he might be identifying you know sort of for whatever reason, identifying too closely with the character and now losing sight of those differences, and maybe that will give him back. It's 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 what um, who is it? Copeland. When I teach acting um, theory, I always start with Copeland, which was the French actor that um, Stanislavski read. But he's the one that is like the Sarah Bernhardt technique. It's like pre 19th mm. century. But he has one concept that I love, which is the first self and second self. That the actor always has the first self, which is the artist, and the second self, was, which is the character. And the, the second self is how you paint. You know, the first self uses the second self to paint the portrait of your character right well in the case of this kid his second self is is confused he's not he thinks that his second self is his first self and his first self has to take some more charge here uh-huh that's you know i mean i'm not talking stanislavski with you now because these are the things that are coming to me in terms of solving the problem not terms of teaching or training or thinking, but I think if you can take all the good work that he's done and now pull it back into the, um, you know, make him now, now that he's found the character, make him meditate on how this character is different than him. Yeah, this is really good because um, I, w one of the Stella things, Stella, Stella would say, you know, how is the character like you? How is the character different from you? But yes. what you've given us is something much more specific to look at in terms of in what way are they different? Right, because it traps you through. And when I've used it in my classes, I literally make the person just close their eyes and try to envision the character, take everything they know from that character with that character and and really trek that through the questions so i i kind of it's almost like a guided meditation you know where i'm asking them these questions and then sometimes it depends on who the actor is but sometimes i might say now i want you to open your eyes and step into this is the check off piece of it and step into that character and, and walk around this room and show us who he is yeah no that's um, that's very good i i yes i i i've, I've never been able to come up with the exact 
vocabulary for it, I always talk about you morph into the character and mm -hmm. and it's just you sort of like suddenly you put it. Well, Chekhov calls this imaginary body. And, um, you know, it's like I adapt it in my own way, of course, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, the way I teach it is, is always a little bit different because when we teach, we're not being historians. When I write, like if I write in Stanislavski yeah. in focus, I'm not going to tell you this, right? Yeah. Because it's not Stanislavski, it's Chekhov. But if I'm in the classroom and I happen to know it and I think it's going to help the student or help, you know, with this, I have, you know, I will, but I identify, I think that's where I'm a little different than many acting teachers. I will say, now I'm going to use this for you because this is what I think you need. And it's from Michael Chekhov, right? Yeah. So those are my, my, my thoughts, but I, if going back to Stanislavski for a second, you know, he would use these visualizations, but he went, I mean, I think that Chekhov took um, took this one step further. But what I love about Stanislavski is that in most of his career, when he would do a visualization, like if you look at the tree visualization in um, An Actor Prepares, what I love about him is that he would never insist after after the first studio first studio he was he would have said you know pick a tree you know but after his his um discovery that this was a problem and that this was not good for the actor it was counterproductive to the work of the actor to get so involved you know is there's also that place in the book where he where he learns um, and this is in focus where he learns that one of his actresses has had, you know, a baby who died. And then he gives her this, you know, he unknowingly asks her to play a scene about a mother who's just lost a child. And when he finds out that he did that, he's appalled that he did that. And he stops the exercise because he knows that this is not a good thing you know I mean it, I, I have this the, uh, there was a moment where I was thinking about I was going to write a paper about dead babies in, in, <laughs> in Stanislavski because he had a lot of examples of you know plays where babies died like the like the one in the where the baby drowns because the money is being burned right oh yes I mean, yes 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 I mean, something about dead babies that I never figured out, but I'm, it's not important yeah. because I don't want to psychoanalyze it, right? But, but, but. The yeah, I had that is, happen. I, I did what, too. I had that happen by accident and nobody told me that this girl, I was directing a production of JB, that this well, girl. Well, nobody told him either. I know. And, and then suddenly, you know, she's falling apart and, and, and then somebody said, you know, that. And I, I, I thought that's exactly what happens in the book, exactly what happens in the book. So, you know, um, I think what I love about him after this point is that he does all the same stuff, but he never insists on anything personal. He insists on imagination. And but if your imagination goes to something personal, he doesn't swap, you know, he doesn't tell you you can't. Right. He, he doesn't he doesn't say, um, you know, if if it's easy for you, if it you know, and you choose to go there, he doesn't cut the actor off from it, but he doesn't encourage it and he doesn't insist upon it. And um, the the more and more I mean, I in my acting theory class, I always do the visualization exercise of the tree. And then I always ask people afterwards who picked um, a tree they knew and who picked a tree that they just imagined. And there's always like one or two people who pick a tree they know from like their childhood in their, you know, mm -hmm. backyard or something. And it brings to mind their grandmother who came out and gave them. I mean, I don't know. But, um, but there are fewer and fewer of those kids lately. 
in my classes, fewer and fewer of them pick the personal tree and more and more of them let their imagination go. So I think some of the hold of the Strasbourg is starting to slip. Mm. Uh, because the people who, you know, have like this idea that you have to have, you know, your personal um, investment and, uh, you know, will often just go there without any instruction. Yeah. That's why I asked what his prior, you know, yeah. understanding was. Um, no. I mean, he it, may it, have a very deep presumption about what acting is that, you know, defaults to this, but that doesn't matter. You don't have to know it. That's psychotherapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? True. True. You don't need to know it, but that may be why at a certain point. Well, and I also think, but it makes sense in what he was building. Mm -hmm. He was building something about how could the Nazis do this? And and he even in in um, historically what he used when they um, when they freed the concentration camp that they did, Eisenhower brought all the people from the local town and made them walk through the concentration camp, and he chose that he saw a man turn to his wife and said, this is all a lie. Mm. So, I mean, it was a really good choice. Yeah, a really good choice. Because he was trying to get to, and I, because I said to him, you're, you're being too um, understanding. Um, we, we saw some interviews of, of the real guy before he died, and by that time, he was a psychotherapist. He was in his 80s, and he was, you know, very forgiving of everything in life. And mm -hmm. so, um, at any rate, so um, I was well, trying... Well, I don't know if this has answered your question. No, but this is really good because the issue to me was... There but was... I think that's how I would intervene because... I, I, you know, you can't ever lose control of your character. I mean, you can, it, it's what, um, you know, when Stanislavski says you can't ever walk away from yourself on stage, I mean, he really means that as the artist, you know, you're always there. And if you lose control of that ability to be the artist, yeah, you throw, you know, you, you just... You just throw away your freedom. I mean, you can get away with it sometimes in a film because yeah. the cam sometimes because there can be an editor who comes in and salvages what's there and, you know, comes in and edits. But you can never get, you know, but it's not going to get you the next job. No, it's going to be, you have a reputation. Because you've, co you've created a disaster for the, you know, for the editor, too. I've had them. I, I, one of the things that I've 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 done. Um, Carnegie uh, talks about. Um, um, <laughs> I've uh, hidden my self view, which makes it easier for me to talk to you without seeing my face. Ah, uh, yes, mine's in shadow. Um, but uh, no, uh, one of the things you translated that I liked, which was r really interesting for me was um, the, the part about Stanislavski saying daydreaming your character in all sorts of yeah. di different places. And okay, I have, an, I have another good exercise for you to use, okay? Um, but, 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 but don't give it away to the world yet, okay? okay. Because I want this in my... In my um, my book at some point but it's it's maria knables this is also something else he can try or any of your students can try after they've been working on a role for a, for a while probably i told you this before because it's one of my favorites so stop me if i'm repeating myself but it's a knable chair exercise where um what she asks you to do is you sit in a chair Every character has to make a decision um, in the play they're in. Every character always makes a decision. There's z z decisions to be made. And the you pick some decision 
that um, that is in the piece you're working on. And what you do is using everything you know about the facts of the character, everything you understand about the world of the character. You sit there and you talk your you you let your inner monologue talk yourself into say that into this decision. In other words, you line up in your mind as if you were thinking as the character, all of those things that lead you to make the decision in the play that you do, you say only one word, yes. When you make the decision, you say yes, and you stand up and you go as if to do it. So you, you, you start walking and as you walk, you talk, you using everything you know about the play and the world of the play and who you are and all of that, you talk yourself out of the decision. So as you walk to go to it, you, you, you think of all the reasons why this is a bad decision to make. You talk yourself out of it, you stop, you say no, and you come back to the chair. And what this does for someone who's been working on a role for a while is it really can shake you up and make surprises and make connections between things that um, really illuminate um, you know what's going on in the play so this is this is what i use a lot it's a wonderful exercise once you've been working on a character for a while yes I think anything to break it up. I, I, I one of the things I'm, it, it's um, young actors often have so little life that they're aware of that it's difficult to come up with choices. I mean, it's uh -huh. they're terribly, terribly conventional, and so yes. so um, they they get kind of stuck. So I think this is also a great way to break them out yeah, of stuckness. Yeah, because it's what. What, what sparked my reminding you of it was um, the fantasizing. Because it is a kind of active fantasizing within the framework of the character. Yeah. No, that's great. I, 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 th I think that's great. No, I, uh, yes, I've urged them all to build these characters in, <laughs> well, there, there are things I call, you know, every choice you make doesn't have to be Hamlet. And so <laughs> it's like, and that's what I liked about the Stanislavski thing about imagine, you know, daydream your character in insignificant things. Um, mm -hmm. character. And, but, but listen, this is really good because I think trying to figure out well, specifically. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I'm jealous that you have somebody who gets you doing a podcast. I don't have that luck at the moment. I hope my book, when it's finished, it brings me a little, I, I feel like, um, that there are some people who just do their work and don't know how to have any talent for marketing their work. And I feel like I have no talent for marketing I, my I, work. I don't. I, I don't. And Stella did I'm just didn't. so pleased. <laughs> I'm so pleased that you like mine and you found my work. And it's just so exciting to me, you know. And um, I, I'm very happy we're colleagues and that you like to quote me. I